all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We also want to thank Eisenhower Center. It's a brain injury recovery center. Learn more about eisenhowercenter.com. They're located in Michigan and in Florida. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. We want to thank Vet Biz Central, which is part of the U.S. Small Business Association, VBOC, Vet Business Outreach Centers. Vet Biz Central covers Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, and can be reached at vetbizcentral.org. Let's move on to our programs. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Randall A. Liberty. Randy, welcome to Veterans Radio. Oh, thank you. It's great to be with you. Well, uh, let me set this up for our Veteran Radio listeners. Uh, uh, Randy uh, Liberty is a retired command sergeant major. He spent about 24 years in the Army and the Army Reserves uh, from about 1982 to 2006. But he has an interesting uh, professional uh, life as well in terms of law enforcement and corrections. And we're going to get to that uh, because I think he brings some unique things to the table. He is currently the commissioner for the state of Maine Department of Corrections, and he has served as a sheriff uh, and a warden of a prison. So he brings those things from the state of Maine to this national audience Randy, let's start with this. Let's set up the early life. Tell tell us about uh, young Randall and uh, why you ended up heading into military service. Sure. So I was um, I lived in a uh, here in in Clinton, Maine, and um, it was a it was a challenging sort of um, financial situation we grew up in. Um, I had uh, three brothers and uh, my mother. My father was. Uh, surprisingly, my father was incarcerated often. In fact, the uh, first time that uh, I arrived at the Maine State Prison was 1971 to visit my father. And, and you know, 35 years later, I was the warden. So pretty interesting journey. And uh, that prison actually is the inspiration for Shawshank, Stephen King here in Maine. And, um, and so, you know, difficult times. Dad incarcerated, not much money, uh, welfare, free hot lunch, uh, surplus food, all of that. Um, we were raised in a mobile home that after eight years, we sold it for a thousand dollars. So um, you can imagine the, the kind of environment that we, we lived in. And uh, but we all played sports. We played football, ran track, baseball. And um, I think that uh, we had whatever success we had was a result of hardworking um, mother of integrity, read to us a lot. And um, and then uh, the coaches that played that that uh, coached us positive male role models. And that's kind of how we navigated. Uh, my brother was a year ahead of me and he graduated in 1981. And uh, his way out was to join the army and get away and make a better life for himself. And he did. And uh, he was stationed at uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, back when that was open as a military policeman. And I went to visit him and it seemed like a really good life. I felt it was very similar to football with a sort of a brotherhood. 
and a sense of belonging. And I saw how he, when he came home in his uniform, how he was proud. And I wanted some of that. And so uh, my senior year, I also, I also uh, enlisted in the delayed entry program and went to the recruiter and asked him to be a military policeman and give him as much college money as he could. And um, away I went. Well, it's, uh, I want to I want to back up to this because I think it's easy for people to overlook the the positive role that they can play. You, you mentioned the coaches and your mother really is that early influence uh, when you know people might otherwise look around and say, "Man, your life is just you know chaos." And and may, maybe elaborate a little bit more on the importance of those early role models and and supporters. Yeah, it's critically important for me to be able to see a male teacher or a male coach. And um, because my father wasn't around much, and when he was around, um, he was often drinking or there was often domestic violence in the home. And so when I saw those positive male role models and they taught me how to speak to a woman, taught me how to speak to young people, how to um, lead. Um, you know, and that's where I think some of my core leadership uh, um, attributes come from is those coaches and and uh, there's someone to look up to. And they had goals and they had short and long term goals and they had success. And and um, that's the example that I took as I grew up. You know, I, I think I had a decision to make. And um, often, as we know, we can learn as much from people that are poor leaders and make the wrong decisions by indicating that I don't want to travel that path. And so. Um, I learned that from my father and from the world positive role models, the direction to travel. I saw they had nice homes. I saw they had nice jobs. I saw they had good relationships. And that, I wanted some of that. And this wasn't a decision that you were going to be career military, I don't believe, when you went in. And I don't think the, I don't know if your brother ended up being career military. But, but you know, most of us start out with, you know, we'll do, we'll do our tour and then we're going to get out. Um, but something resonated with you along the way, didn't it? Yeah, sure did. I I found something special in the army. I, I fellowship, that brotherhood, that pride of putting the uniform on, um, the the um, you know the richness of traveling to foreign countries. I mean, when I when I graduate from AIT, military police school, I go to orders to go to Korea. So I had an opportunity to serve in in Yongsan for fourteen months, and I found that to be rich culturally. Um, you know, it was important for me knowing that. My mother dropped out in eighth grade. My father got his GED at Thomaston State Prison. And um, I saw the struggles that uh, lack of education brought. And so it was important for me to um, secure as much college money as I could through the GI Bill. And I did. Um, so uh, after I did my first three-year enlistment, I had a decision to make. My brother was in Germany. And um, he decided to stay in. And he went from military police to 11 Mike, a Bradley fighting vehicle crewman. And I decided that I wanted to get out and uh, pursue a full-time law enforcement career, but still um, be able to enjoy the fellowship that uh, the military brings. And I, and I joined a National Guard unit. As a military policeman, I always felt as though I wanted to be more of an infantryman. And fortunately, here in Maine, there's a mountain infantry company. And um, I served there um, while I was going to college and when I started my law enforcement career. I gave sh- a short shrift to the uh, Army National Guard. I skipped right over that and went to the Army Reserves. So I apologize for that. No, no trouble. And, and, and I, you know, again, it's one of those things where you just sort of make that decision. If you like what you're doing, you stay at it. Um, you, you're getting something all, all along the way. And one of the things you went in knowing you wanted to come out with is more education. And you were able to do that. Um, and, and climb, uh, if you will, from an associate degree to a bachelor's degree to a master's degree. Um, that was Im- obviously very important to you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, you know, I, I learned very early on that education is critical to any success. And, and when the window of opportunity opens, you need to be ready. And so I did my first uh, three and a half years at University of Maine at Augusta. And then I had an opportunity to um, get hired by the Kennebec County Sheriff's Office, where I remained for 24 years. And, and while I was a while I was um, at the Sheriff's Office, I was a canine handler. I was a, a drug investigator. I was a rescue diver. Pulled a bunch of victims from lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, I did I did that work, and I was going to college simultaneously and raising a family. And so, as you mentioned, I was able to pick up an associate degree in criminal justice, a bachelor's degree in public administration. 
And then as sheriff, um, I went back to, to school and I, I picked up a graduate degree in leadership from Liberty University. And um, that served me well along the way. Um, and um, so simultaneous to that career in law enforcement, I did seven years in a mountain infantry unit, went to Italy with them and trained to the Alpini mountain soldiers. Um, I then joined the reserves and became a drill sergeant with the 98th division and went to drill sergeant school at Fort Devins and then um, pushed troops at uh, Fort Benning and Fort Leonardwood. And um, then I picked up a master sergeant chief instructor at West Point and I taught there for three years. And uh, that was an honor um, to work with those those young soldiers. And uh, and then in 2004, I volunteered to be on a MIT team, 10 of us embedded with an Iraqi infantry battalion. We recruited them on the Iranian border. And then uh, Fallujah kicked off in the fall of 04. And we went down and, and fought with the uh, RCT-1 and RTC-7, the Marine Corps, first and second Marine divisions. And we fought our way into the, to the uh, city and we occupied for about 10 months. And I'm going to, I told Randall at the outset, I, I wanted to talk about that, but I'm going to push some of that to the end because I want to talk about what I think is kind of unique here. And that is, you know, um, you had this opportunity, you were, in a, you were in the sheriff's department, you got elected sheriff, and, and then you were moved on to uh, corrections as, as the warden of the state prison. Mm-hmm. T- talk to us why that uh why that uh, change in direction maybe a little bit and and how the things you'd learned in service kind of came to bear as well. Yeah, so for me, um, I had done 26 years at the Kennebec County Sheriff's Office. I was the chief of five and I was the elected sheriff of nine. Um, when I when I left for Iraq in 04, um, you know, I truly didn't understand the impact of war. I'd been in the Army system for 23 years, but you don't know until you know. And um, you know, the, the fighting in Fallujah, um, a lot of casualties, and I saw a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, sacrifice in the city. And so when I came back, um, I was a bit changed. And so, um, you know, I had post-traumatic stress as a result of not only the time that I served in Fallujah, but also the 20 plus years that I had served in law enforcement with the unattended deaths, the suicides, the self-inflicted gunshot wounds, the fatal accidents, the rescue diving, all of that was kind of, um, um, you know, combined to kind of place me where I was. And, and it was there that I then that I recognized, the, you know, that there was a lot of work that could be done with veterans returning and uh, those that struggled with the criminal justice system. And, you know, how could I help? And so that's when I began the journey of uh, creating a veterans pod at the Kennebec County Jail. Um, I served on the main military community network as the chair. I did an awful lot of work with veterans both um, law enforcement veterans and then those that had been arrested and placed in jail. And so I found that work to be very meaningful and um, the moving on and retiring from the sheriff's office, uh, moving on to the main state prison as the warden uh, gave me a larger platform, larger budget. Um, I could, I could get more done. I felt and make a difference in people's lives. And that's when I created the veterans pod there. And uh, there we have 64 veterans that are, co-located in, in that pod, and they have the you know, shared experiences of being veterans, and we have Vietnam vets, Iraq, Afghanistan, Panama, we have uh, every flavor you can imagine, every branch, and uh, that shared experience of being in the military uh, really gives that, that, that unit a special feel, and a lot, of, a lot of good things happening in that unit. Well, and it's, you know, there's this interesting line, you, you sort of mentioned it, which is there's a lot of veterans who are in law enforcement, and I certainly have those in my family. And you have uh, far too many veterans who are on the wrong side of the law. And I think the FBI statistics are something like 8% of all, everybody incarcerated is a veteran, which is way above the national numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, the sacrifice of war and service and what you see sort of adds up over time. You, you noticed it from your law enforcement career and your military career. You said after a while, it just became a lot to, to carry and you had to begin addressing some of the PTSD and other issues uh, uh, j- just to make sure you were stayed on the, the right side of the line. Didn't you? Yeah, for sure. So when I came back, um, my, uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress were quick to anger and quick to emotion. And so 
when I went to when I went to Iraq, I thought it was important for me to come back and tell the story. I was a I was a 40 year old and and um, I did a lot of public speaking and I'd speak to groups. I brought a lot of my sort of um, war artifacts with me and and um, I tell them when I began to speak, I said that there may be a time when I'm speaking to you that I have to pause and I get emotional, but it's just a natural response to the trauma that I've I've faced both in law enforcement and and in Iraq and. Um, um, yeah, I did. Uh, I did need to uh, get help. I went to Togus VA, and um, um, I received some help outpatient. I would go every Tuesday at one o'clock, and I would dread it because it would be like ripping off a scab. And um, I'd find any excuse not to go. And uh, my my brother, who was retired Army, he's an infantryman, and uh, my wife um, sort of uh, teamed up on me and, and ensured that I went and they followed up on it. And so did the VA. They, they'd call me and they were, where are you? Why aren't you here? And then over time, um, through therapy, my symptoms uh, were diminished and um, my triggers didn't happen as often, but I still, you know, I was, I was in law enforcement, so I still carried a gun. I still smelled the, the brake free, the oil, that same wet, same lubricant we'd use when I pulled my M4 up to my nose. Um, I still go to gun calls. I'd still see, you know, death and dying. And so there are still triggers, but you just have to find a way to navigate through that. And uh, there are a lot of paramedics, EMTs, law enforcement officers that have served and are military veterans, and there is impact. But um, I would say this, there's no dishonor in getting help, and um, you and your family um, deserve it. You've earned the, the help, the assistance, um, and uh, your life will be better for it. And I think too many guys get worried about how's this going to impact my job, and and I don't want it on my record, and I don't want people to think I'm weak. And and uh, th- those of you who don't know uh, Randall A. Liberty here, the uh, commissioner of the state of Maine Department of Corrections, he's a badass, and and um, uh, he was willing to take uh, you know whatever risk associated with, hey, I need to, some help to have a better quality of life, and that's really what. We kind of got to get the message out to more guys on is the VA is there to help you. Um, your family's out there to help you. You should let them help you, shouldn't you? Yeah, I agree. One of the things that was important for me is, uh, as a sheriff at the time and as the warden is to be out up front and say that this is a natural response. It's, um, you know, I, I talk to my guys and say, I was a drill sergeant and, and I would say things to the privates like, don't contaminate my army with your weakness and suck it up. I don't want to hear you complaining. And, and we, we promote that sort of uh, outer shell and toughness, you know, and it serves us well in combat. But when you come back, you have to let those emotions out. And you have to be honest and frank about it. And um, me working with other veterans and, and assisting them in their journey and them helping me in my journey uh, made all the difference. And, and um, I was fortunate enough to be approached by Jennifer Rooks of the Maine Public Broadcasting, and she wanted to do a project uh, related to veterans and post-traumatic stress. And and so we worked on it, and uh, the, the documentary is called A Matter of Duty, and you can Google it, A Matter of Duty, Maine Public Broadcasting, and it shows an hour-long, um, you know, sort of some of my struggles and how I came, how I resolved them, and then it follows five fellow veterans um, that struggled, and, and some were successful and some were not, um, but it just tells a journey, and it tells the, uh, the cost of war, and, uh, you know, the cost is is uh, is really a family affair the family's along with us for that trauma and that and that recovery and so um if if the listeners have an opportunity a matter of duty made public broadcasting it's worth a listen um it allows you to know that you're not alone and um the struggles are real and you and your family deserve to get help well and it does you want to break that generational cycle of trauma that that uh, all too often can go from one generation to another, and, and fortunately for veterans, you have available services through the VA, and we'd certainly encourage folks to utilize those things. Um, let me come back to sort of a, maybe some of your philosophy on um, uh, the men who are incarcerated, and in particular the, the um, veterans that uh, you've uh, had under your custody and control whether it was in the sheriff's department, in the jails, or, or in the, as a warden in the prison, and now as commissioner of the main uh, department of corrections. As you look at these men, um, talk to us a little bit about your philosophy on how to 
um, deal with them during the time that, uh, again, they're, they're sort of under your custody and control because you've done some unique things? Yes, you know, my, my primary philosophy with anyone in corrections is, is about redemption. I believe in redemption. I believe that all of us at one time or another ask for forgiveness. And I believe we can all be born again and we can move on to another chapter. And uh, with the veterans that have been in my care, when I speak to them, um, it's important for me to, to talk to them and say, I understand because I've been there too. And um, I very easily have could have been could have been arrested or caught or made a judgment call with anger management issues, domestic violence issues, um, self-medicating. Um, we're all very close to that and how we deal with post-traumatic stress and, and the trauma of service sometimes. So my philosophy is um, you um, um, laid it out there for us. You dedicated um, X amount of time and years and efforts and, and sacrifice. Um, it's my duty upon return to assist you in your transition back. And so that's what I, 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 I don't judge. Um, I assist them where I can assist them. I tell them that I too had struggles, but I worked my way out of it and I'm here to help you. And so we don't leave anyone behind, no man left behind regardless. And so that's the philosophy I've taken with the veterans pod, with the veterans transitioning back, with veterans that don't have law enforcement issues and are coming off active duty. I spent a considerable amount of effort working with the Department of Labor to recruit them and uh, welcome them to the sheriff's office and welcome to the main uh, state prison and the main department of corrections, letting them know that they have a home and they have a job, period. It, it, and we, we're in an environment where we're veteran friendly and you'll, you'll see rank structure and chain of command and all those things that you're accustomed to. The main department of corrections is hiring veterans and we do all the time. And you really also have a sort of adopted programming that is impactful for these guys, and and uh, there's three or four different types of programs. Why don't, why don't you start with the the gardens that you've uh, uh, adapted as a program? Yeah, so one of the things that, that I enjoy doing is, is gardening, and uh, I'm a master gardener. And um, when I my one of my philosophies in corrections is try to do things low cost, no cost. Tax dollars should be um, held uh, sacred, and um, when I take that dollar from that 80 year old widow. I want to make sure that I use that dollar uh, very efficiently <coughs> and I use it well. So what I've done is um, we collaborated with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and we've now certified 60 of our residents, 60 of our inmates, to become master gardeners. All of the area at the Maine State Prison and other of my, my facilities, we've tilled up all the land. Um, we've um, composted all the organics coming out of the kitchen. And at the Maine State Prison, we feed 3,000 meals a day. And prior to my arrival, all of the leftover organics were being thrown out the back and brought to a landfill. We started the organic um, um, composting process. Now all of that is uh, rotated back in the soil. And um, last year, I think we did 30,000 pounds of food inside the prison walls with those master gardeners collaborating with greenhouses on the outside and doing low-cost, no-cost um, efforts. They provide a, a limitless salad bar to their fellow residents and to the, the staff that are working there. Fresh vegetables that are grown and picked this morning, and they're on the salad bar tonight. So those kinds of things have been therapeutic for individuals to nurture a seed to a transplant, transplant that into the ground, and then grow tomatoes, cucumbers, radishes, beans. All of that um, has really worked well. One of the things we've certainly talked about on Veterans Radio before, and we're talking to Randy Liberty now, a command sergeant major retired, um, has been in law enforcement uh, for his professional career. But one of, the, one of the things we've talked about, Randy, over the years is the importance of having a purpose and, and feeling good about what you're doing. And I think a, a lot of guys transition, they sort of feel they lost the purpose when they get out of service. Maybe they head in a direction that they're not very proud of. And, and a program like this really gives them purpose and something to be proud about, doesn't it? Yeah, you, I'm glad you, you brought up purpose because we all need a reason to get out of bed and feel good about ourselves. And so one of my core philosophies is purpose-driven incarceration. When you arrive, we need to identify what exactly brought you there, and, and we need to get busy on fixing that. If it's post-traumatic stress, we need to get you treatment. If it's substance use disorder, we need to get you help and, and programming that way. And so... One of the things I do in the veterans pod is we partner with the America Vet Dogs. 
the American Vet Dog Organization produces um, service dogs for disabled veterans. <clears throat> what we've done is we have uh, eight, eight labs um, that are in our facility in the veterans pod, and they're trained for about 14 months. We certify uh, veterans uh, to be, uh, become canine trainers, and they, treat, they train those dogs to be released into the community with veterans. And so they have a real purpose, sense of purpose, um, still giving back to fellow veterans. And that's worked very, very well. We've done three cycles of, of those. The guys are very proud of the work that they've done for fellow vets. Well, and it really gives you, uh, you know, that uh, purpose and, and certainly in dealing with uh, training dogs. We, anybody who's a dog lover knows you get this unconditional bond and love uh, from the animal. So it, it, it's good all the way around. And, and I'll do a little uh, promo for a friend of uh, Randy's here and mine, which is uh, Craig Grossi. Craig uh, is the author of, you may know him from the book, Craig and Fred about uh, Fred the dog he sn- uh, snuck out of Afghanistan during his tour. Uh, he has a new book out called Ses- Second Chances, um, which talks about uh, his involvement at the Maine State Prison and, and getting to know Randy Liberty and what's being done to um, assist veterans and others through some of these programs, the gardening program we just talked about, the American Vets uh, service dog program, but but you've also adopted sort of um, volunteers who have their own skills. Uh, Craig Grossi, uh, as an author, uh, established a writing program. There are music programs. Talk to us again about the importance of these kinds of volunteers and their programs. Yeah, Craig was a, a real gift to me and to the fellow veterans, both incarcerated and free. And the work that he did in the veterans pod was critical. Um, it's one thing for, for a paid employee to go into a pod and spend time with, with the residents, but something other to have an individual that doesn't have to be there, that's a civilian, that doesn't have to go into the prison, and they give up their own time to volunteer and help these, these individuals transition. And like with anyone else, we want to feel as though people care about us and they're not forgotten. Just like when we're deployed, it's not, it doesn't matter what you receive for a care package or a letter. Um, it's just that people have remembered you and, and, and care enough to think of you. And so Craig was a gift. Another uh, set of volunteers are individuals called the the Liberation Institute. They came in and they volunteered to teach um, yoga and and mindful meditation. And not only did they they teach that, but they also certified 18 of my residents to be nationally certified yoga instructors. So those yoga instructors now go into the units with their fellow inmates and uh, they teach yoga and it really quiets the pod. It gives uh, mindful reflection, and um, it gives people purpose. And uh, those those volunteers that come in for yoga, for the canine programs, for the writing programs, for fly tying, um, for any of that sort of work that they're doing is really profound and makes a difference in these men's lives. I think it's easy for most of us just not to even think about the guys who are incarcerated. And, and maybe we'll think a little bit about them if they're veterans and go, ah, oh, geez, that's just too bad that, you know, they have a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue. But we just don't spend much time thinking about it, which is why I'm so happy to have you talking about it today, uh, Randy. How, how do people get themselves uh, maybe uh, enough courage uh, or, or enough interest to say, maybe there's somewhere local I could reach out and help? No, there absolutely is. We know that the, the people that arrive in my facilities have mental health issues, substance use disorder, trauma in their background, uh, learning disabilities, um, a combination of all of that, neglect, poverty. That's 99% of the, the people that I have incarcerated. And they're people just like you and I. And if you think about this, if you unpack that young woman or the young male that's, that's incarcerated, and you can help them pivot to be a successful citizen, um, you make a difference not only in their lives, but in their parents' lives and in their children's lives. So if I'm working with a, with a young lady and uh, she has three children and the grandmother who's 70 is watching the, chi- the children, I make a big difference if we can get her on the, on the right path, uh, getting her the right treatment, getting a good vo- vocation, um, you know, and helping them. You help a lot of folks, and it makes a big difference. Well, and I, I do think there are folks out there who are able, 
ready, willing to help, and they just kind of need that nudge. And hopefully this discussion will nudge them in that direction. Certainly if you read Second Chances by Craig Grosser, you it'll really nudge you in, a, in the direction of the value of the time that you devote. But I want to talk about the mental health problem uh, for a minute, uh, if, if we could, uh, Randy. It, it's a challenge, I suspect, for any state um, organization, certainly Department of Corrections, to have sufficient resources to deal with those kinds of problems. Is there a relationship between what you're doing in, in a Department of Corrections and what the VA uh, can offer to veterans who are incarcerated? Yes, they um, they do. They're um, challenged a bit because they can't provide services that we're obligated to provide. But what they do provide at the VA is they bring a, li- a liaison in and uh, let everyone know, all the veterans know what exactly their rights are and uh, what they have for benefits. Um, others like Easter Seals, uh, the the uh, vet centers, um, the Bureau of Veterans Affairs. Those organizations come in and they do a lot more work in internal uh, to the facilities, and they do a great job. And that um, you know there are quite a few assets, and there are quite a few individuals that want to come in and want to assist um, if you ask, and uh, you provide an environment where they feel welcomed, and um, they don't have to be, you know, apprehensive about can I get in? How difficult is it to get in the facilities? Will I be turned away? Um, you know, if you, if you knock down those barriers, um, you'll find that there are a lot of people in the community that care about veterans and uh, they want to do good. In fact, I've been able to, we have an Amer- American Legion post on the mid coast and we created an American Legion post inside the prison in the veterans pod. It's, it's the Brian Buecher Memorial American Legion post. And that gave the, the managed sense of belonging. Um, we have uh, American Legion, um, uh, leadership that comes in, helps them with the meetings, gives them focus, um, and that's really worked well also. So the service groups, the VFW, the American Legion, the DAV, those those have all been very helpful assisting the veterans on the inside. And it creates a bridge uh, uh, when they get out of, of a group that they might have an affinity to and a relationship with, and that's got to be helpful. Oh, very much so. You know, the, the, one of the, the biggest challenges with incarceration is transition. And if individuals have a home church or a home lesion post um, and um, any of those resources that may be helpful to them in transition, they'll be apt to be much more successful. One, one of the other things that I think is um, worth talking about to somebody who's an expert in law enforcement and corrections is there's sort of a national trend now to recognize the need for some state court diversion programs whether they be mental health, but a lot of places are adapting veterans courts as well. Um, Have you seen that in Maine and have you, have you have an opportunity to see the value of it? Yes. We established a veterans court in 2006 in the state of Maine. And it was very, very successful. Um, Janet uh, Mills, the governor, her sister-in-law, Nancy Mills was the justice and it worked extremely well. If you watch a matter of duty, you'll see actually the veterans court and how that's working. Um, we've had some really good success. We've been able to give um, best uh, best case, uh, worst case scenarios and give the veterans an option, good wraparound services for the veterans. The district attorney is a specialist in veterans affairs. Um, we have uh, main pretrial, which does the management of those individuals. It's gone very, very well. Some really nice partnerships. We currently now have two veterans courts in the state of Maine, one in Augusta and one in Portland, and uh, it's going very, very well. A good example of where people could help locally as well to keep veterans out of being incarcerated by working with veteran courts and diversion programs. And I know we've pushed the uh, command sergeant major up to his time limit. Um, I appreciate the extra time that you gave us today, Randy, and all of the work that you're doing in the um, uh Department of Corrections for the for the state of Maine. Um, I'm glad that uh, Craig put us together and created an opportunity to talk to an expert with uh, your experience, not only in the military, but law enforcement and corrections. Well, it's an honor, it's an honor to be with you and anyone listening. If you'd like any assistance or anything uh, I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, Randy Liberty, the commissioner of the Maine Department of Corrections. And thanks for your time today. Thank you. Nice chatting with you.
And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, the U.S. Small Business Administration Veterans Business Outreach Center, Eisenhower Center, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. They keep us on the air, as does your support. Go to Facebook. Go to veteransradio.net and support our efforts. And until next time, you are dismissed. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, avoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.